Please join me by turning your copy of the scriptures to 1 John. Way back in the back of the Old, uh, the New Testament, 1 John chapter 5. And the title of the message this morning is uh, Regenerated Overcomers. And both of those words are important. I'm trusting that as you uh, look at this passage of scripture, and more than that, even the book of 1 John, it will, you will be able to appreciate what it is that we want to say to you, or that God wants to say to us uh, through the Word of God this morning. So what I'd like to do is take a little bit of time uh, to give you sort of an overview of the book of 1 John so you get a feeling for where we're going to go with our message message today. You can turn to 1 John chapter 5. Actually, we're going to begin reading in chapter 4, as you'll see. But if someone was to send you a letter and you only went to the end of the letter and read a couple of paragraphs, you might appreciate what that person said, but you probably would not be able to understand all that was being said in that message because you wouldn't have had the full context. You wouldn't have had the introduction. You wouldn't have known where you were jumping in uh, much later in that letter. And it's the same with the epistle that John wrote to this group of churches. And so what I'd like to do is begin reading in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. And I trust that as we read what would be maybe a lengthy passage of Scripture, we'll be able to really focus and follow along and not be distracted as we uh, continue reading the Scripture here, even though it is uh, more of a lengthy portion that we want to read. And then we'll spend a few minutes giving an overview of the book and helping you to understand how chapter 5 and where we're going to look at these uh, four or five verses in chapter 5 really fit in. So please follow along as I begin reading in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. 1 John 4, verse 7 through 5, 5. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this love of God was manifested towards us in that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, what should be our response? Verse 11, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him, and He in us, because He has given us of His Holy Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Chapter 5. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. As I thought about preparing for this week and think about the time of year it is, one of the things that we focus on and think about, not only in the city of Charlottesville, but in other places, is a time of final exams, right? We remember, even if we're a little older, that that's what we did at this time of year. We took tests. We had to pass to move on to the next 
grade. Maybe it's a, a test to get into college. Maybe it's a final to finish the year. Whatever it is, we all have to take tests. And you remember how it is, even if you didn't do one, take one this year. Whatever kind of exam it was, there was always a, a nervous apprehension. What would the test be like? We were, not, we were always unsure about the teacher's questions, how well we were prepared. Did we memorize enough? Did we grasp the content? Would there be any trick questions? Any surprises? Would the test even be reasonable? How would they grade the, the exam? We didn't know. So we're always under pressure because, well, we need to pass the test. So much is riding on this in order to move on to the next level. When we think about exams, when we think about tests like this, there's never a more critical test than the test we would call the test of faith. And these are the tests that the Apostle John has for us in this small letter that we have read a portion of this morning. It's very important that we make sure that we understand the questions and that we can pass the tests, the exam that's given to us here in this book. To understand 1 John, we need to understand several things. And as we go through the message this morning, I'd like for you to be able to keep recalling some of the background information that I'll give you right now. It's very clear that John the Apostle wrote this letter. He was at this time much later in life, and he was pastoring uh, probably in the city of Ephesus, a number of churches, probably house churches. He was uh, near the end of his ministry for sure. But he was writing to a group of people who were understand, uh, undergoing uh, difficulties in persecution, not just uh, persecution from the, the culture that they lived in and from Rome, but also the kinds of trials that would come upon people who were uh, being challenged by false teachers. And these false teachers had a couple of different um, kinds of attacks. One of them would be the attack of what later was called Gnosticism. It's just a fancy word for higher knowledge. It was related to some Greek uh, thought and some ideas of dualism. And this was that you, had to, uh, you could ascend to a higher level of knowledge. You really didn't need the revelation of Scripture. In fact, this higher level of knowledge would, um, would judge God's revelation. And only the sophisticated or the intellectual or certain kind of people could actually be elevated to this. It also had the idea of dualism, which meant the spirit and the body were different. So the idea would be that Jesus couldn't have come as a man because then he would have a body. He would be sinful and that would be impossible. So you're going to see that even in our message today. The other kinds of attacks were ones that were more familiar to us. And that would be the attack of people that we would call Judaizers who would say, no, you still need to keep the law of Moses not just the, keeping the Ten Commandments, but everything there. So it really was a fleshly kind of attack that would say that the gospel of Jesus Christ and faith in Christ alone, that would not be enough. You would have to also keep the other, other rules in order to be saved. So it would be a works kind of religion that would be taught. And what you see in, the, in this letter by John, especially as you look in chapter 2, is that some of these false professors, some of these false teachers had actually been in the churches. That's exactly what Jesus had said was going to happen. It's exactly what Paul said was going to happen when he spoke to the people in Ephesus in chapter 20 of Acts. He said, they're going to arise from among you. They're going to be dressed like sheep, but they're not sheep, they're wolves. And so we have to be careful. So John was speaking to a group of uh, believers who had this kind of problem and this kind of challenge. And it's not different than the challenges that we have today. Because false teaching is everywhere and it takes on every kinds of form. And it, uh, those attacks are prevalent even in our day. And so we have to be careful that we understand the truth. Not only the truth about the gospel, but the truth about the word of God in general. What it means and how to apply it to our lives. And so... John's, one of John's major purposes in writing this letter was to clarify the truth about Jesus Christ and the truth about how to be saved, but also the truth about how to know that you really are a Christian. What are the tests that we would pass in order to be sure that we are genuine believers? So I want you to uh, turn back to the beginning of the book and look at the first couple of verses in chapter 1. We'll do the bookends for a minute, okay? We'll look at how he begins the letter in chapter 1, then we'll see how he closes in chapter 5. And this will help us understand a little bit about the flow in between, but also to help us get a grasp on the purposes for John writing this letter. And it'll help you, I think, help us to understand the section we're going to read and, and look at in chapter 5. So John begins this letter by saying this. And remember, he was with the Lord, right? 
the disciple Jesus loved? This is the one that's writing this. You can back think about John chapter 1. And we beheld him, and we saw his glory, full of grace and truth, right? Here's what he says. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declared to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Right there you have several ways of looking at his purpose. I want to tell you about Jesus Christ. I want to remind you of how you can have true fellowship. This is the word koinonia. And we use that a lot, but really it's talking about genuine fellowship that comes from really knowing the truth and really abiding in Christ. He also says, as you see, he wants their joy to be completely full. Turn over to the end of the book, the end of chapter 5. And let's just uh, look at a couple verses as he closes this letter. John chapter 5, 1 John 5, 18, he says, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding, that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. What an interesting way to, to close a letter, but fitting when you think about what he's said. So John has a number of purposes in writing. He also has a certain style. When you understand the book of 1 John, what happens is John uh, attacks a particular theme. And he begins to develop the theme, and then he moves on to a different one, and then he comes back to the first one. And each time in this spiral, he adds more depth and more content. So we have a greater understanding. We'll see that even as we look at our message in verses uh, 1 to 5 of chapter 5 today. The other thing that John does is he explains things, expresses things in black and white. You just saw that as we read the end of chapter 5. He says, whoever is born of God doesn't sin. Doesn't give any exceptions, it's black and white. And one of the ways that we understand things sometimes is the by way of contrasts. So we say black and white. That's a big contrast. What are some of the contrasts in John? I wrote these down so I wouldn't forget them. Truth and error, light and darkness, life and death, love and hate, Christ and antichrist, righteousness and sin, of God and of the devil. There may be more. That's the way we see uh, the truth that John is presenting by seeing the opposites, and that helps us to clarify things. And we'll see that even as we, as we go this morning. So that's the, the understanding of the background. The readers, as today, we would realize that the gospel is under attack. The church is under attack. You, as believers, are under attack. It's because we live in this thing called the world system. And never, never before in, in my lifetime or yours have we seen such uh, virulent and, and uh, frontal attacks on the truth and on our faith. And we need to know how to respond to that. And the, one of the ways we respond is by knowing the truth, knowing for sure that we are genuine believers, but also knowing the truth about the gospel, about the word of God, about Jesus Christ, and about salvation. So we can not only know for sure that we belong to God, and as John says, are of God, born of God, but also so we can know how to respond to those attacks as they come. Let me ask you a question. If someone was to come to you and say, how do you explain Christian living? What would your response be? How would you uh, respond if someone said, would you please explain to me how you view uh, spiritual growth? How do, how do you grow in Christ? How do you understand Christian living? One of the ways that you would explain that is by taking them to the book of 1 John. And you would take them to 1 John chapter 5, as you were going to see this morning. Because when we look at this section, we really understand a whole lot uh, better in a much more clearer fashion what it means to walk with the Lord, what true fellowship is, and how we can know for sure that we are true believers. 
So still in an introduction, uh, what I'd like to do is, is show you something that says something about the, the three tests that we see already in the book of 1 John, and we're going to see repeated for us in chapter 5. There are three major tests that can be described in a couple of different ways, and we're just going to use the word moral, relational, and doctrinal. So what does moral mean? Okay, we know morality, right? Well, here we use the word moral to talk about righteousness. Holy living. If a person uh, says they belong to the Lord, and this is the big focus of chapter 1, right? You have people in chapter 1 who were liars. They didn't only lie to other people, they lied to themselves. They were false professors because they said, I haven't sinned. And John says, look, if you're living in sin, you don't pass the test. You failed. So the first test is a test of morality. It's a test of righteousness. Do, are we really in Christ? Are we living a holy life? Or is sin controlling us? Is sin habitual? We might, we might ask. Those are the questions that we would ask to see if we pass the test. And John uh, really focuses on that particular test and comes back to it a number of times. And I've only mentioned chapter uh, 2, verses 3 through 6 as an example. If you're taking notes, you can write that down, and then you can follow that test throughout the book. The second test is one we'll call relational. And this is a relationship between you and God and between you and your brother. Now, the primary commands of the Old Testament are what? The two, two greatest commands? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. It's expressed in a couple different ways. And what's the second command? And love your neighbor as yourself. Now, someone came along and they said, okay, and talk to Jesus, right? Who's my neighbor? Well, John doesn't answer it that way. He just says, look, if you love God, you're going to love your neighbor and you're going to love your brother. And we'll see in chapter 5 how he explains that. But if you don't pass the relational test, oh, you might have passed the moral test. You might be okay on that exam. But if you're not a loving person, then you have reason to ask, am I really regenerated? I'm certainly not going to be a, an overcomer. If God has changed your life and given you new nature, then you are going to become a loving person. It doesn't mean we are always loving. It doesn't mean we never do anything that's unloving. But we are becoming more loving in, in our whole life. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's the first fruit that's mentioned. And so the relational test is a very important one, and we see that in chapter 2 as well. And then the doctrinal test, one that's a major focus for our message this morning, is the test of truth. Primarily, it's a test of the nature and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to see that in chapter 5 here in just a moment. But you can't be a genuine believer if you don't pass the doctrinal test. So you can be a nice person, you can do good things, you can be a sort of a loving person, you can even be a moral person. But if you reject the person and the work, the nature of Christ and the offer of salvation as given in Christ and Christ alone, then you haven't passed the test and you are not a genuine believer. And John makes a, an issue of this because of the people that had been preaching in these churches and have gone out from them and because of the attacks they were receiving from the world. So those are the three tests and those are the kinds of things that we want to uh, think about as we, as we look at our passage. So, uh, with that in mind, let's dig into chapter 5 just for a few minutes. And what I'd like to do this morning is to go through the passage um, two different times, so that, well, mainly for me, so that we really understand what's going to be said here. So we're going to look at the verses in a little bit of a detail and then come back and kind of review what we just saw. Okay? Reviews are always helpful. So look at chapter 5 and verse 1. And as we do that, we'll, we'll come back and look at these tests again, because you're going to see them right here in these verses. Let me read these for you again. And chapter 5 is, as we've already seen in our reading this morning, kind of an unfortunate chapter break. You know, the chapters are not inspired, right? So we, we remember that we were talking about what love is, and how a Christian, a true believer, really loves. Chapter 5 begins this way. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. I like the English Standard Version a little bit better. I'm reading and, and preaching through now the uh, New American Standard. The English Standard Version has a 
a better expression of this, and it doesn't use the word begotten, it's a little bit more clear. Verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Now that's already caused you to ask some questions, I'm sure, as you think about that statement. Verse 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who has overcome the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. One of the ways that we understand this passage is by thinking through the, some of the key words, some of the key phrases, some of the terms that come to us. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So here we have the word born. It's, it's a regeneration. It's a, John said it in chapter 3. He's, he's expressing the, the relationship, communication between Nicodemus and the Lord Jesus himself about being born again. The person that believes that Jesus is the Messiah, the sent one of God, the anointed one of God, he is born of God. But he goes on to say that everyone who loves God himself is also going to love the one that's born of God because there's a relationship, right? I'm his child, you're his child, so it just makes sense that we're in the family. We would love each other. It's more narrow and more focused than loving our neighbor, right? It's very focused. And he says, verse 2, By this we know that we love the children of God when we do what? When we love God and keep His commandments. Because John has already said, look, don't say you love God if you don't love your neighbor. Because you can see your neighbor, but you can't see God. So don't say, I love God, if you're not loving your neighbor, because he said that's impossible. And it's clarified to us in this verse because he says, you know that you love your neighbor when you obey, when you keep His commandments. Well, how does that work? What does that mean? Well, what it means is, God gives us very clear instructions. We call it the will of God. We call it the commandments of God. We call it the Bible on how to walk with the Lord, how to serve the Lord, how to live in this world, how to be a Christian, how to love people. So when we obey God's commandments, we love people. When we keep His commandments, we will be loving. So that enables us to have a real clear sense of what that really means. Verse 3, probably in another life, another time, I would be a, I hate to say this, but I would be an English teacher because I love grammar and I had to study Greek and I had to study Hebrew and I had to learn Portuguese. But I notice words and I want you to notice words. What's the first word of verse 3? Four. That's right? Okay, it's a connecting word. He's explaining what he just said. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. You say, how do I love God? You love God by being obedient. And Jesus said that to His disciples in John chapter 13. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. Well, we'll talk about that again in a moment. I looked up the word burdensome to, because I wanted to understand more about the background for this word. And you know what I found in uh, looking at the Greek term for burdensome? Do you know what I found that it means? It means burdensome. <laughs> it, it means it's an oppressive weight. It means like it's, I'm carrying something that's really heavy and slows me down. God's commandments are not burdensome. But I said to you in the reading a moment ago that you might ask the question because you might be thinking, well, it seems to me like that's real hard sometimes. But John's going to explain why that is because in verse 4 he uses the same word again. For whatever is born of God. You're regenerated. You belong to the Lord. You are of God. That's one of John's favorite expressions in this, in this letter. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. You not only overcome in the sense of being able to delight in God's commandments, but God's commandments are not a burden to you because you're regenerated. You have a new nature and you overcome everything. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. You could trace the word faith all the way through the book of uh, 1 John. Go back to the Gospel of John. Faith is a big word. Yes, love is the bigger word. But the word faith here is the same idea of verse 1. Whoever believes... That Jesus is Christ, is the Christ, is born of God. 
And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So the faith that we have to come into this relationship with God, the faith that we have to where we enter into a regeneration experience by God's grace, and so we are His children, it's the same faith by which we trust God every day, by, we respond, how, by how we respond to His commandments, and by how we um, trust Him to enable us to live. So believing and faith are highlighted for us here in this passage. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. What was the title of our message today? Regenerated Overcomers. We're going to win, we're going to overcome by faith, because we are God's children. Verse 5, John asks the question, Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So you can see how he cycles back again, even this short, short section. Verse 1, he says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And there he says, Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So I said we would look at the passage in two different ways. Let's do it now by picking out a couple of principal ideas that we've just seen. First of all, I want you to understand number, in verse 1, the content of faith. John is not saying, all you have to say is, I believe Jesus is the Christ, and then you're regenerated. He's not saying that. We know he's not saying that because, first of all, that didn't even, doesn't even make logical sense. The second reason we know he's not saying it is because if we read the rest of the of 1 John, and for sure, the rest of the New Testament, we know there has to be a whole lot more than just some affirmation about a fact, right? Because earlier in the book, he said, God is light. And we have to walk in the light. So it demands an admission. Go back to uh, chapter 4 and verse 14. I'm going to make sure we get this. 4.14. The content of faith. See, we have to fill this in. We see this statement. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Messiah, this, the anointed one, is born of God. We fill in the content by this by looking at verse 14. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. That means we need a Savior. We admit there's a sin problem. I need to repent. So we're adding content to what he just said in verse 1. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God... God abides in him and he in God. So we're not asked just to make a simple affirmation like many people who would be considered or call themselves Christians in our culture or many cultures around the world. We are people who understand that Jesus Christ, look at chapter 5, was sent by the Father so that he could die for our sin, so he could pay the price that we needed to pay. So he become our substitute. And we see it in chapter 5 in another way, as we get later in the chapter. Verse 10, uh, verse 11. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is where? This life is in his Son, John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father Except by me. It's a narrow way. So we added, we're adding the content to what he said here in the very first verse of our text this morning. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So we're not going to preach a whole sermon just on that verse, but the whole idea is it includes repentance. It includes admission that Jesus is the only way. It includes an embracing of Christ as our personal Savior, a recognition that he died on the cross, he rose from the grave, He's ascended now to be our mediator and all of those things, right? So that's the gospel, and that's what we need to believe. So the first principal idea we would review here is the content of faith. The second one is the idea of regeneration and new life. And we know what regeneration means, right? We're born again. You had an old nature, you now have a new nature. You're born again by the work of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, bringing new life into you in a miraculous, supernatural way, uh, what we call the new birth. It's a regeneration. And without a regeneration, there is no new life. There is no salvation. And that's what he says in verse 1. And when he uses the old King James word, begot, we just say born, right? A person that's born again. Everyone 
who believes that Jesus is Christ is born of God. Go back and look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1, he said, Jesus came into the world and the world did not accept him. They didn't believe him. But to those who received him, he gave the authority to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. Not of flesh, not of works, not of the will of man, but by the will of God. That's regeneration. That's new life. First principle is the content of faith. The second one is regeneration. The third principle is love and obedience. And these are connected because a regenerated person loves. And a person who's not born again doesn't really have the capacity to love in the supernatural, agape kind of way that's, that's challenged for us in the scriptures, and in particular in this passage. So the third thing is love and obedience. How do we express our love for God? You can say, oh Lord, I love you so much. But see, it's not just a sentimentality we're talking about. It's obedience. It's a submission to God's will. And so obedience, obedience, Jesus said, is the way you show your love to Him. So we keep His commandments. We value His commandments. And that brings us to the principle number four. And I ask the question, are His commands burdensome? Are they heavy? Do they slow us down? Are they oppressive? Is it a weight? No, it's not. Because God's commands are not like, to us, a legalistic requirement that we have to keep in order to survive, in order to be saved, in order to keep saved. That was some of the teaching that was prevalent during that day. No, God's commands aren't burdensome. Because when... A parent, a loving parent, makes a rule or gives some direction to his children. His children obey that command because they, they desire to please their parent and they, they have a relationship and they know that what their parent is saying to them is for their best interest. And we make mistakes as parents like that sometimes, but God doesn't make a mistake. And when God gives us a clear command from the scriptures, it's for our good. And so what happens? The psalmist says, your commands are so hard and so burdensome. No, he doesn't say that. He says, I love your law. I delight in your commands. God's commands aren't burdensome because it's based on a relationship. And because we know that God wants the best for us. He desires the best for us. And so we want to obey him. Not just because we want to please him, but we, because we know when we go in the way that he commands, we're going to be safe. We're going to be blessed. We're going to have a relationship with Him. It's how we're going to have fellowship, just like in the family. Fellowship is a little bit subjective sometimes, but you have the, the best relationships within your family when you're communicating together and when children are obeying their parents and parents are communicating with their children. And so God's commands are not burdensome because He loves us and He desires the best for us. And as a regenerated believer... We desire to have a relationship with him, and so we're going to value everything he says. Warren Wiersbe had an interesting comment about that, and he talked about the fact that we don't typically write songs about um, the legal system in our country or the local, the local laws like, um, you know, you go to sit down and write a song about how, you know, isn't it great, the uh, speed limit's on Route 29, da, da, da. You don't do that, but because that's a legalistic requirement, and those can be burdensome, right? Now, I'll put into your mind all the different kinds of laws we have around here, not just the traffic laws or violations, but God's law is not like that. And so we write songs about it, and we sing about it, and we love Him, and so we delight in Him. But we mentioned uh, the idea of the four that was connected up with verse uh, 4. F-O-R and F-O-U-R. Verse 4, the connecting word for whatever is born of God. So the first principle idea is the content of faith. We fill that in by understanding what the gospel means. The second uh, principle idea is regeneration and new life. As a person that's born again, I can have fellowship with God. I can love my brother. I'm truly a, a genuine uh, believer and I live a righteous life, and I'm going to pass the tests. And the third one is love and obedience. The fourth is commands are not burdensome. And the fifth is the world that we have to conquer. And that's related to number four, burdensome commands and conquering the world. Because the world that we live in makes life real difficult. 
Let me, let me talk about the world for a minute, okay? We're not, when I say the world, John has already expressed this for us in the gospel and in the first John uh, letter that we're looking at. John uses the word world in a whole lot of different ways. He talks about, he can talk about the, the physical universe. He can talk about the world that we live in just in moving, like we could say, pick a couple words, academics, athletics, achievements, I just picked some A's. Those are three things that are in the world. Those things are not evil, they're not morally, they're morally neutral, they're not sin in themselves, uh, um, in those three things. Academics, athletics, achievement. But he also uses the world in terms of world system. And that's an evil system that's under the control of Satan that uses those kinds of things because of the flesh and because of satanic attacks so that academics can become an evil in the sense that uh, that's all of our focus and we don't love the Lord and, and achievements can become a problem because it's pride and athletics can become a problem in the world because that's our sole focus and we don't spend time with the Lord. You see what we mean? So all of the, even the good neutral things can become a problem because of the, the influence of the way that John uses the word cosmos or world. And we see that back in chapter 2. And I know you're already thinking that because in chapter 2 of this book, he said, Love not the world, neither the things in the world. He doesn't mean by that don't, don't love, he's not saying don't love books. It's okay to love books. He's not saying uh, don't, don't love to go to the baseball game because that's okay to do that. What he's saying is that's not your primary love and you have to be careful that those things can, can intrude onto our relationship with the Lord. And so what happens is the world system comes at us because Satan uses the physical things in the world in this organized or unorganized system under the control of, the, of, the, of, of Satan. Which, remember we saw, we saw that at the end of chapter 5 where he says, uh, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So he says, don't love the world, because if you love the world, that's a problem. If you love the world, you don't love God. And you don't love the world because it has the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, right? The lust of the eyes. Those are the things that, that we don't want to do. So that's what happened in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve loved the world. That's the way Satan attacked Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. He went after him with the lust of the eyes and the lust of uh, the flesh and the pride of life. And John says, don't love the world, because if you love the world, you're not loving the Father. But when we think about the world system that we live in, we realize that we're under attack by the world. We're under attack by the prince of the power of the world. Except, John says, you are not of Satan. You are not, if you're a believer in Christ, you're not of the devil. You have a new relationship. You are of God. So this is the world that we live in. But what, Jesus, what John is saying to us here in this passage in chapter 5 and verse 4, with this connecting word, is we, this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. You see, the world itself is what makes God's commands burdensome. When you think about the, the, uh, the way the world system looks at things and how it hates us and hates God and how it presents things as being, this is where you get prosperity. I mean, this has got to be popular. This, this is what you really want, right? Then when we get twisted in our thinking by that, then we begin to think, God's commands, I mean, that's just, that's burdensome, that's a problem. But when we think properly about the world that we live in and we understand how the attack is coming and we deal with the pride of life and the lust of the flesh and lust of eyes, we see God's commands as freeing to us. And that's why Jesus said what he did to the, to the people of his day. He says, if you, if you are under a great burden, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest for your soul because my burden is easy. My burden is light. And so we are able, he says in this verse, verse 4, to overcome the world by our faith. That is, we trust the Lord that His way is right. We overcome the world by realizing that in a faith relationship with God, we see the, the, the things around us differently. 
We don't respond to those kinds of temptations. We're not sucked into the world system and we're not controlled by the, the things around us. And we're not even controlled by what evil people say. And we don't give in to the attacks of Satan. But we uh, delight in God's commands and we're going to be able to win the battle. You know, one of the most important metaphors in the New Testament for the Christian life is the illustration or metaphor of warfare, spiritual warfare. We, we have to remember that we're in a battle. I think sometimes when I get discouraged or when I fail, I, I look back and I say, oh, I forgot. I forgot that I was on the battlefield. I forgot the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith among other things. So the metaphor of the battle is very helpful to us. And it's very helpful to us because John says the world is attacking us. We are under attack. We are in a battle. And it's something that we have to win. The, the scripture here says the world hates us. And if you're hated by someone, some entity, something, that makes a difference. So how are we going to respond? Well, we're going to respond by faith, and that's how we're going to win. So the sixth, sixth principle idea that we have from this passage to point out is victory. It's a conquest. A lot of different words for that Greek word, Nike, which uh, we get Nike. It's the Nike missile. It's the Nike shoes. I don't know that wearing Nike shoes always guarantees um, victory. I, I didn't experience that personally. But that's the idea from the Greek. It's a, it's a winner. And, and John uses the verb nikao many times. He used it in his gospel. He uses it here. He says, we're going we're gonna to be overcomers. Not just going to squeak by. If you read the book of Revelation, you see him using the same word there. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. And to those who would be faithful to the end, Jesus says, you will overcome. So we're going to be winners. We're going to be regenerated overcomers. We're not